He's here. He's here. Now, broadcasting from, from the underground command post, deep in the bowels of a hidden bunker, somewhere under the brick and steel of a nondescript building, we've once again made contact with our leader, Mark Levin. Mark Levin here, our number, 877-381-3811, 877-381-3811. Nikki Haley was banking on Iowa. She came in third. Nikki Haley's now banking on New Hampshire. And uh, she's sounding more and more like a Democrat. She spent $30 million in New Hampshire that has a population of 1.4 million people. That's a ton. She's got every rhino ex-governor imaginable campaigning for her. Asa Hutchison, Larry Hogan, Chris Sununu is making ass out of himself left and right, but that's okay. And uh, she keeps using Democrat knee-jerk talking points, race and genitalia. And then people say, well, I've had enough of Trump. I want to vote for her. And I'm going to vote for her for what? Some people I don't understand and I never will. Over the National Pulse, they point out that Nikki Haley keeps saying we need an accountant in the White House. Because she's got her bachelor's degree in accounting. And... Nobody's done a deep dive on this except the National Pulse and a few others. Nimarada Nikki, her name is Nimarada. Nimarada Nikki Haley has repeatedly used the line, it's time for an accountant in the White House. During her Republican presidential primary campaigns, the assertion functions as an attempt to criticize her rival's spending records. But despite having a bachelor's degree in accounting, Haley does not and has never held a CPA certificate public accountant license. That's a very difficult test. I wonder if she ever took it. Seriously. But don't expect the media to ask her. Her book experience is limited to her time as chief financial officer, quote unquote, at her parents' gift shop business, Exotica International Inc., Exotica's financial record is quite poor. The company was hit with three liens for failure to pay taxes, resulting in thousands of dollars in penalties with interest. The National Pulse reports records show Exotica also had a habit of filing taxes over a month late, well above the industry standard, and it closed its doors in 2008. The financial troubles followed her to the Trump administration, Bankers attempting to foreclose on her parents' lake house in South Carolina tried to track her down at her United Nations workplace, and security had to turn them away. Haley once listed her Exotica salary as $125,000, requesting the same amount when applying for a job in the Lexington Medical Center. Her tax returns, however, showed she never earned more than $47,000 a year from her parents' company. 
Kelly has also been careless with her personal taxes and has had to pay thousands of dollars in late payment and penalties in the 2000s. Hmm. There you have it. Who knew? Who knew? Well, Haley knew, and she's running around acting like she's the, uh, she's the financial expert. But there's more. And by the way, you want to talk about a fiscal conservative, talk about Ron DeSantis, as I say, in Florida. Boy, he runs a tight ship. This is from uh, Robert Spencer, man I've great respect for. And he's writing at PJ Media. He says, give me a break. Kelly claims that in the South, she was teased every day for being brown. Can Nikki Haley read the room? Apparently not. With the New Hampshire primary just two days away, this was the other day, obviously. On Sunday, she played the race card in a big way, making outlandish and implausible claims about her youth in South Carolina. Whose votes is she trying to win? Those of patriotic voters who are thoroughly sick with charges of racism being used as a weapon, or those of the entrenched Washington establishment that weaponized those charges? The answer isn't even close to being in doubt, he writes. Kelly came out big for identity politics on NBC Sunday, Meet the Depressed. We were the only Indian family in our small southern town. I was teased every day for being brown. So anyone that wants to question it can go back and look at what I've said on how hard it was to grow up in the deep south as a brown girl. Now, wait a minute, he says. It's very common for kids to tease one another and to seize upon whatever is available to do the teasing. But did Nikki Haley really experience racism in the Deep South? She was born in South Carolina in 1972. So she's talking about suffering from racist teasing in the 1970s and 80s. Yet Haley didn't grow up in the South of of, uh, Theodore Bilbo and Bull Connor. She grew up in the New South of Ted Turner and Jimmy Carter. When even old segregationists, including George Wallace and Strom Thurmond, were apologizing for their old stances and courting support from blacks and whites who had earlier disdained them for their racism. Haley, however, dug in even deeper, adding, if you want to know what it was like growing up, I was disqualified from a beauty pageant because I wasn't white or black because they didn't know where to put me. So, look, I know the hardships, the pain that come with racism. She was five years old. And I don't know about this, true or false, but you know who she sounds like to me in this, Mr. Producer? Kamala Harris, who, by the way, is the first female vice president, not a gent, as Haley would put it. And how's she doing? Unmitigated disaster. Spencer says, is she expecting us to believe that there was a beauty pageant in South Carolina in the 1980s disqualified anyone on the basis of race or even took any note of race at all? If there had been. And if what she says happened had really taken place, Nikki Haley and her disqualification would have been international news. Says discrimination of the basis of race had been a federal crime since the Civil Rights Act in 1964. And the New South was anxious to put it past, behind it, project a new image to the world. Haley South is closer to Hollywood, where fat, drawling, racist sheriffs still prowl the land looking for poor black folk to devour than to anything that has been seen in South Carolina or anywhere else in the South for decades. And so Haley's claims were met with the scorn and derision they so richly deserved, he says. The Babylon Bee quickly published an article entitled Nikki Haley Recalls Her Daring Childhood Escape from Slavery on the Underground Railroad. Dinesh D'Souza, who also has brown skin and Uh, in Indian heritage. He said, I came to America from Bombay, India, at the age of 17, and have spent the past four decades in the most conservative precincts of American life. If I've never once, not once, been teased for being brown, and I'm browner than Nikki Haley, so what's going on here? Well, flagrant pandering to the left, Dinesh, says Mr. Spencer. That's what's going on here. I don't know if she's telling the truth or not. But why does it matter? She's running for the nomination for president of the Republican Party. She was governor of South Carolina. So why does it matter when she was five years old, if in fact it happened? 
But this is the mentality. So she plays those two cards plus the feminism card. Which the ladies in my life, my mother-in-law, my wife, my daughter, my stepdaughter, my niece, find repulsive. Absolutely repulsive. And I come from a family of strong women. And I've talked about this before. Strong women. All of whom are and were Jewish. And not once did I hear them. Playing any cards about being women or Jewish or anything else. They just work hard. They use the opportunities that this country provides them. They don't believe they were born victims. They don't believe that any failures they've had in their lives, like we all have as a result of a racist or anti-Semitic society. You just plow ahead. But apparently Nikki Haley doesn't believe that. What she should be talking about Is the American dream and the opportunity that was provided to her family like so many other families. But she doesn't. She doesn't. She's relying on non-Republicans to win the Republican primary. Then she's going to South Carolina, she said. Then she's going to Super Tuesday, no matter what. No matter what. Look, she's free to do whatever she wants. I could care less, as long as she isn't the nominee of the party that needs to stop Joe Biden and the Marxist Democrats. She's just no Margaret Thatcher. She's no Margaret Thatcher. And as every day goes by, it proves it. And by the way, I must say today, the media, they are doing their best to help Nikki Haley. It is grotesque. It is absolutely grotesque. They don't know what to ask her. They're not informed. They don't know what to press her on. She sits there, responds to open-ended questions. And then there are the, the Democrats and the liberals who want her to look good and sound good and all the rest of it. I've been around long enough. I've seen this over and over and over again. Over and over and over again. Remember when Reagan was running, how wonderful, how beautiful John Anderson looked running as an independent because they wanted him, they wanted him to upset the Republicans to get their man elected president of the United States. I remember all this sort of play and all this stuff. And there's still a lot of dumb people who fall for it. The fact of the matter, if you want a Romney, or another term of George W. Bush. If you want these imbecilic platitudes that you're hearing coming out of Nikki Haley's mouth, then she's your lady. But if you understand what we're up against in this country, and why not a single Republican presidential candidate was on the debate stage with her, has endorsed her. Not even Christie yet. Not one. Oh, well, excuse me, Asa Hutchison, but he really wasn't on the stage. He was in the first row. That's what Beatty was. You want to think about that. DeSantis, Ramaswamy, Scott, Bergman. Who else was up there, Mr. B? I don't remember. Other than Asa Hutchison and Chris Christie, who's still probably very upset, probably gained 78 pounds since he had to withdraw. But that's neither here nor there, of course. They all endorsed Trump. They didn't have to. They're not vying for vice president. They didn't have to. But they did. You respect the former Secretary of State, Mike Pompeo? I do. Straight shooter. Was a great Secretary of State. Well, you ought to read his book. His autobiography. Nikki Haley, he says, was not a team player. 
she would go off on her own. Not because she was brave and courageous and strong and independent. Because she's a self-promoter. That's why. You people in New Hampshire, many of you are voting as I speak. You've got to decide if you're going to vote for more of the same out of the Republican Party, Mitch McConnell type, or you're going to vote for real change. Because that's what the Republican establishment fears, that's what the ruling class fears, that's what the Democrat Party fears, and that's what the billionaires, the uniparty billionaires and Democrat billionaires fear, because they are making a massive fortune above what they have as a result of Biden's policies and McConnell going along with them. I'll be right back. Mark Lovin. We're going to have the congressman in charge of investigating the January 6th committee. Barry Louderback of Georgia on the program in the final hour and all the things that have taken place, the destruction of information and so forth, I want you to hear from his mouth. And next hour, we're also going to have the ambassador, the former ambassador under Donald Trump to Israel, David Friedman, on how the Biden administration's pressuring of the Israeli government and the Israeli military to fight a house-to-house, room-to-room war has resulted in the death of 21 of their soldiers today. These soldiers are young people. Many of them are not regular military. Many of them are reservists, doctors, plumbers, nurses, ambulance drivers, rabbis, bakers, candlestick makers, just the average guy on the street. The country calls them up because they're under attack. And these 21 died because the building collapsed. It was booby-trapped. And these Israelis are fighting in Hamas-controlled territories. It's their turf. They know how to how to set up all these, uh, all these, you know, disastrous situations. And you didn't hear a damn thing from Biden or Blinken today because they are responsible for so much of this blood It's unbelievable. He's driving the media mad. Mark Levin, call in with your outrage. 877-381-3811. Here's the analysis, Mr. Producer of New Hampshire. You ready? If Nikki Haley wins, it's the most earth-shattering election in American history. This is how it will be positioned. Headlines, hosts wetting themselves, people falling over each other, even though we all know that the biggest voting bloc in New Hampshire, which is so screwed up electorally, are so-called independents. Even though Nikki Haley has spent $30 million in a tiny state with 1.4 million people, even though she is the backing of the Republican establishment nationally and in the state. Even though Joe Biden, Mr. Democracy, and his party have said, don't worry about New Hampshire, we're not competing in New Hampshire, their vote doesn't matter, plus I don't think I can win there, so we'll start with South Carolina. That's Mr. Democracy. So you have a lot of people that may participate in an election for, say, a Democrat, who now won't. So they're just kind of fear. what should I do? Mischief. And they're being encouraged to do that. So if Nikki Haley wins, it'll be the most important election since 1864, when Abraham Lincoln won re-election. My God! She's the first woman to win a Republican primary in New Hampshire. My God! She's the first Indian American minority to win a primary in the head. We've never seen anything like this before. She took out the gents. My God, this is historic. 
unbelievable. Now, if she loses New Hampshire, well, you know, New Hampshire's never been a bellwether state. Well, as Joy Reid would say, you know, not enough black people, brown people there, just too many white Christians, you know. So that doesn't represent anything, of course. No. Big deal, big deal. Donald Trump wins in a state he was supposed to win, you know. Think I have this about right, Mr. Producer? So why spend all the money sending 5,800 people to New Hampshire from all these press organizations? I just told you what's going to happen. How they're going to report it. How they're gonna, and if she's close, it's going to my God. Look how close she is. You know, when I grew up, the line was, close but no cigar. You ever hear that phrase, Mr. Producer? Close but no cigar. But here it's going to be close. My God, it's historic. A woman's never come this close to winning the primary in New Hampshire. No! And a woman of color, too. Whoa, wow! Never before. Just too damn many white people in that state. So the demographic of the vote, and I'm not here speaking about race, I'm here speaking about party affiliation. Most of these independents are liberals. I'm a no-label. Excuse me? I'm smarter than you. I'm better than you. I, I think, whereas you just do what the party tells you to do. No, I identify with a philosophy. You know, our founding philosophy. The kind, no, no, no. No labels. Excuse me? No labels. But no labels is a label. You just called yourself no labels. No labels. Right. You're no labels. You know what that means? No principles. No substance. We just all want to get along. Now, how stupid is that? How stupid is that? Country's collapsing and there are no labels. No labels. No labels. Man can be a woman. A woman could be a man. Man could be a frog. A woman could be a, a lobster. You know, what? there are no labels here. No labels. Bathrooms, no signs. Just have a picture of a toilet. That's all. But make sure the lid is down. We know the ladies, I mean the no labels, don't like it up. Have you noticed that, Mr. Producer? Oh, yeah. They don't want to fall into the toilet. You understand. So, the whole... How can I put this? The reporting is as corrupt as anything else. The reporting is as corrupt as anything else. Let me tell you a little secret. Donald Trump's going to be the Republican nominee. There's another 48 states out there. Nikki Haley can win maybe some states in New England. Who knows? But then when you get into real Republican country, red states, she doesn't have a snowball's chance in hell. And I hate to tell her and Sununununununu and... uh, Larry Hoagie, looks like he's had a few of the Hoagies. Subs, you know, steak sandwich. What is with all the fat guys, by the way? They always go like Rhino, got Christy. And, uh, but anyway, that's, that's for another day. Another day. I don't understand. They think they're going to get the Republican nomination by blowing off the base. Is that how the Democrats are? No, no, the Democrats fund the base with student loan forgiveness. Embrace the base. You know, the base takes try in our party. The base is under attack. The base is extreme. And yet our biggest winners come out of the base. The biggest winners come out of the base. And these rhinos are schizophrenic, you know. We want to run right now. We're very Reagan-esque. They hated Reagan. They fought Reagan. They defeated Reagan and they backed Bush. Excuse me, Ford. Same thing. Then they backed Bush against Reagan. They tried to do everything they could to stop. I would argue the third greatest president in American history. Washington, who they hate. They hate Washington. 
<coughs> Lincoln, they're pulling his statue down. Then in Reagan, the Republican, the Republican rhinos, I hear Sununu and Chris, you know, Reagan. Reagan was, you know, Reagan was the guy. I fought for Reagan in the 1976 primary. I was 19 years old. We were in a small minority in Pennsylvania. The establishment wanted, wanted Ford. I fought for Reagan in 1980 in Pennsylvania and beyond. The Republican establishment backed Bush. They didn't want Reagan. I told you this, man. I had county commission. Reagan can't win here. He's too conservative. This is what you hear all over the place. He can't win here. He's too conservative. Turns out that Bush won his first race for president thanks to Reagan. And when he ran on his own the second time, he lost all these states. They always talk about all oh, these conservatives are MAGA. Can't win. They never tell us all the disastrous rhino establishment candidates on the side of the roads having been losers and lost. I see no reason to support a Nikki Haley. I see no substance. I see a quintessential flip flopping politician. I see somebody who will say anything, which is why. Let me suggest to you that on that debate stage, she was the nastiest of them all. She attacked Ramaswamy. She attacked Tim Scott because he disagreed with her. She went after him. She attacked DeSantis, probably one of the nicest people you could possibly meet. Well, Trump did that, but that's Trump. They keep telling us that's a negative. But when she does it, it, they act like it doesn't even occur. She's already pulled the race card. She's already pulled the feminist card. She's already pulled every liberal woke card she can. She says today, I'm going to secure the border and more. And how is she going to do that? We have no idea. No idea. She's going to control spending. She couldn't even do that in her own family business. But that said, how? What is she going to do? Does she support shutting down the government? Does she support slashing domestic spending, Obamacare? What is it? We don't know. Well, you don't get away with that forever if you're the general election nominee. But how do how, we don't know? We have no idea. She's going to take on China after having coddled China. But exactly how is she going to do that? We don't have the foggiest idea. None. None. In many ways, she's a stealth candidate, which is why she has to flip-flop all over the place. She has constituencies all over the place and no constituencies all over the place. In other words, an empty dress in many ways. Or suit pants if you're, you know, pantsuit if you're Hillary Clinton. But that's what's going on here. She wants disaffected Republicans, independents who want no labels. Can't we all just get along? Apparently not. They won't leave us alone. They won't leave our appliances alone. They won't leave our automobiles alone. They won't leave our kids alone. So I guess we can't just all get along. Then, of course, the radical kooks on the other side. And now, now we see what the media is already doing. I've seen two articles, one in Politico, which, of course, is an offshoot of the Washington Post. It's corrupt as hell. And some other outlet. I think actually it was the New York Post editorial something. I, I think I'm right. Sounding much like Politico. MAGA hates the moderates. How are they going to win them over? What? MAGA hates... The moderates, how are they going to win them over? I think to myself, what, do we have children writing these editorials? You've got to get the nomination and stand for the principles of what is supposed to be a principled party. You're running in a Republican primary. Once you get the nomination... You don't throw out your principles. You don't throw any of that out. But you must change the focus of your election. 
you must take your principles and your message and tell them legitimately, not with trickery or, or deceit, but tell them legitimately to appeal to as many people as you can. That's what Reagan did. That's what everybody does. I don't know, is Nikki Haley trying to appeal to MAGA? No. Well, isn't that important? Apparently not. So again, there's nothing disingenuous or dishonest about it. It's a campaign strategy. Again, you don't give up your principles. But the electorate is different. The electorate is different. But if you give up your principles in the primary, not for messaging purposes, but because you have none or you don't believe in them, then why the hell should you be the nominee? Why should you be the nominee? So if Nikki Haley does well or even wins, you will be told tonight that as New Hampshire goes, so goes Alabama and Virginia, Georgia and Pennsylvania, Missouri, Montana, Wyoming. Of course, it's a lie. But with the free Democrat Party media, the multi-billionaires who've made out like bandits under Biden, the Trump haters, they're all over TV, free media. The Republican establishment, the ruling class, they're going to want you to believe, oh, it's really a two-man race, it's over. It's not a two-man race. It's not a two-man race. It's interesting. For some people, it's fun. You go through the process. The states need to speak. I got it. Very important, actually. But in the end, no Nikki Haley. I'll be right back. Mark Lovin. Mr. Democracy, Joe Biden forces Robert F. Kennedy. Great senator, great man. I certainly didn't agree with everything, but that doesn't change anything. Assassinated. And forces his son out of the Democrat Party. Doesn't want this fellow Dean Phillips to even have a shot. So he doesn't want to really run against him. So he pulls out of New Hampshire and he makes South Carolina the official first primary state as far as the Democrats are concerned. Donald Trump didn't do anything. He didn't show up at debates. Oh, what a coward. No, it was a strategy that worked. He doesn't duck, you know, debates, challenges, interviews or anything. That's Biden. But Biden is not Mr. Democracy. Biden is Mr. Autocracy even with his own party, deciding which state will come first, doesn't play by the rules, ever. MSNBC, by the way, breaking on air, this is them reporting, substantial number of New Hampshire Democrats and independents, ready for this, have written in ceasefire and Palestinian state as their choice in the New Hampshire primary. And on MSNBC, they are totally obsessed with wokeism, Roe v. Wade and abortion, and of course, quote-unquote, Palestinian genocide. And I notice over at MSNBC, they're not reporting from the Gaza Strip. They're not reporting from territories held by Hezbollah in Lebanon. They're not reporting from the Palestinian Authority territories. They're not reporting from Tehran. They're not reporting from Yemen. They're not reporting from any of these places. They're reporting out of New Jersey. Now, some of you may not like New Jersey, but it's certainly not those countries in the Middle East, that's for sure. Palestinian state they want. These are Democrats. And I'm sure the Democrats, if they were around in the 1860s, would have been arguing for a confederacy state. Stop the killing. Stop it. Stop it. Nothing is worth this. Nothing. 
give the Confederates their Confederacy. Now, of course, today they'd say, no, 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 of course not. We oppose that. It takes blood. It takes war. Sometimes to prevail, for right to prevail, for morality to prevail, for humanity to prevail. But not at MSNBC in the luxurious studios, no. So Haley is coming third in Iowa. And if she comes in second in New Hampshire, she'll be declared a very dangerous opponent to Donald Trump. Don't buy this crap. I'll be right back. This segment of the podcast is exclusively sponsored by Pure Talk. Pure Talk offers great coverage and can save your family money on your wireless bill every single month. Go to puretalk.com to find the plan that's right for you. Thank you again for listening, and thank you so much for this sponsorship, Pure Talk. This program is heard all over the United States, every corner of the United States, small states, large states, in between states. And what I refuse to do, having covered election after election after election behind this microphone, is to report to you results that are starting to come in in parts of a state where the polls may have closed or parts of a state where counting is taking place. Because I do not believe in trying to influence the outcome of the vote with that kind of reporting. I think I just reject it. Now, all the major networks do it. All the cable channels do it. I don't do it. I have access to the same information. Everybody does. Now, that said, at the top of the hour, when we come back, the polls in New Hampshire will be closed, and then I will share some information with you. But that's as soon as we're going to do it here. Because I believe that people have a right to vote, and they shouldn't be influenced by the networks because we don't even know exactly where these votes are coming from. So they're utterly meaningless early on, 4, 5, 6, 7% of the vote. Now, over at Politico, I touched on this earlier, and at Town Hall, they are correctly pointing this out. Politico is an incredibly partisan Democrat left-wing site. That's what it's known for. That's what it does. And uh, it trashed the hell out of Ron DeSantis as it's trashed the hell out of Trump, and now it's targeting Trump again in support of Nikki Haley. As they write, now that DeSantis is out, and Trump is even more likely to be the nominee, Politico put this headline out, really scrutinizing his chances today. Quote, Donald Trump has a big problem ahead, unquote. In sharing the article, the Politico Post noted that Trump is bleeding moderate support, I quote, could cost him the 2024 election, unquote. There's close to 600 replies and over 400 quota replies on Twitter, which includes those pointing to the curious timing of the political piece. None of this is coincidental. None of this is by accident. It's all intentional. The piece quotes a lot of angry, never Trumper voters who are going with former Governor Haley and or even President Biden over Trump, although... The support for Biden from Haley primary voters isn't surprising if you looked into particular findings from the Des Moines Register uh, poll released just ahead of the Iowa caucuses. They said Donald Trump has a problem. This is Politico. No matter what happens in New Hampshire Tuesday night, there's a whole swath of the Republican electorate. And a good chunk of independents who appear firmly committed to not voting for him in November if he becomes the nominee. Okay, it's way too early for this. When you have a one-on-one situation, it certainly sharpens the mind. It sharpens the mind. And the debate changes almost completely. Not only are the strategies different, at least for Trump, without abandoning principles, but circumstances change. Circumstances change. But they say 2024 is different. Trump is not making his pitch to voters as a first-time candidate. He's known quantity who is being judged by the electorate, not for the conduct of his current campaign so much as his time in office. And that, political veterans warn, makes it much harder for him to win back the people he's alienated, including those once willing to vote for him. Really. So they vote for Biden. 
And it points to the New York Times Siena College poll showing that Biden is more support among Democrats than Trump does among Republicans, although that's just one poll. Other polls, including last week's from The Economist and YouGov, show Trump with the edge in support from members of his own party as well as with independents and with voters who think he's more likely to win. Trump and Biden are pretty evenly split and so forth and so on. And this is where the media come in. This is where the Department of Justice comes in. This is where the Democrat DAs come in um, to try and interfere with, as they are, and change the outcome of an election. Because this is what they do. Let's see here. Trump's with report in, reporters in London, Barry, New Hampshire today, talking about what's going on overseas. Cut six, go. For people that might not have their mind made up tonight or today going to those polls, they might be deciding between you and Nikki Haley. So what would you want to tell those voters? Well, I, look, if they want a great country, if they want a country where we say make America great again, there's nothing like it. Make America great again. That's all you have to say. We are making America great. We had we had this going so well. And look at the world. The world is blowing up, too. We had no wars. Russia would have never invaded Ukraine. Nothing. All of this. Israel would have never been attacked. Never. Remember this, Iran was broke. They had no money. You know why they had no money? Because I said to other countries, you can't deal with them until we make a deal. And we would have had a deal within two weeks after the election with Iran. Iran is spreading money all over. And look at what's happening. We're bombing the Middle East again. Now we're going back into the Middle East. We're bombing the hell out of the Middle East. And it's having no impact. You know why? Because they don't respect Biden. They don't respect him. They no longer respect our country. Mm -hmm. It matters. It's very, very important. And... He's 100% correct. I just think these are very serious times. Very serious times. I don't have time for quizlings, for flip-floppers, for people playing this card and that card and another card. You never heard that from Margaret Thatcher. You never heard it from a Churchill. You never heard it from a Ronald Reagan. You've never heard it from great leaders and statesmen around the world and in our own country. You hear it from people who are playing group politics and trying to appeal to things that have nothing to do with leadership. I'll be right back. Does social engineering from leftist corporations make you feel like we're living in the twilight zone? Well, you're not alone. Pure Talk, my wireless company, knows the silent majority is fed up. And I urge all those Americans to stand with a company that champions your values. Those of you who always have your neighbors back, who pulled yourselves up by your bootstraps, who realize that a little bit of elbow grease can fix just about anything. Well, it's time to join your fellow patriots who fled their old wireless company for something better, Pure Talk. Pure Talk gives you phenomenal coverage on America's most dependable 5G network for half the price of the other guys. And with unlimited plans starting at just $20 a month, the average family saves almost $1,000 a year. And it's a veteran-owned company. Pure Talk is a company you can feel proud to do business with. Just go to puretalk.com slash Levin to join your fellow Americans and make the switch. That's puretalk.com slash Levin and save an additional 50% off your first month with Pure Talk. Mark Levin, the research arm of conservative media. Call in now, 877-381-3811. Welcome back, America. We're here with a great patron, a friend of mine. Former Ambassador to Israel from the United States under President Trump, David Friedman. David Friedman, um, you're watching what's going on, obviously, in this country, but in Israel very, very carefully. And the Israelis lost in one building collapse. I believe it's 21 of their soldiers, 21 of their soldiers. What do you make of that? Well, you know, Mark, so just to put it in context, 21 soldiers is more than 10 percent of all the soldiers that were lost in this battle, which has been about 110 days. So in one day they lost, uh, they experienced more than 10 percent of their total loss of life. And they did it. And this is what I don't understand. And uh, I think a lot of people in Israel don't understand. They did it laying explosives in a bunch of already abandoned buildings. Now, um, there are no civilians there. What happened? They're laying these explosives, and 
they were fired upon by a Hamas uh, terrorist, a rocket-propelled grenade. It hit a uh, one of the explosives, and it triggered a chain reaction. And 21 people were buried in this in the rubble. Now, it doesn't make any sense to me because if you want to if you want to destroy a building, you can do it from the air. You can do it without any uh, exposure to human life. Why would they do it this way? And it just so happens, if you look at the New York Times the day before, there's a big article about how Biden has uh, impressed upon Israel the need to go to a more low intensity uh, style of, uh, of warfare. So, I, I mean, I don't know what low intensity warfare means, but it looks to me like what Biden has been you know, trying to force Israel to do is to basically put more soldiers' lives at risk, to go, you know, to go do things, you know, from house to house and hand to hand when, you know, air power would have been sufficient. And and if that's the case, and I think a lot of people are asking this question tonight, there'll be an investigation by the Israeli government. But if that's the case, then, you know, this intervention by Biden, uh, neither him nor Blinken nor uh, Sullivan have any military expertise at all, let alone in uh, in uh, ground combat in Gaza. For them to insinuate themselves into the uh, daily uh, daily grind of a war, uh, it, it, it has disastrous impact, and it may mm-hmm. have had extraordinarily disastrous impact. You know, twenty one people died that didn't need to die. You know, Mister Ambassador, let's let's just step back a second. None of this needed to happen during the course of the administration you served so well. Uh, Iran was on its back. Its economy was collapsing. The people were rising up. There was some question about whether it could survive. Uh, It didn't have the funds to do what it's doing today. Um, And um, your administration cut off UNRWA, the funding of Hamas, because UNRWA is a very terrorist, uh, pro-terrorist operation out of the UN that was supporting Hamas. And, of course, Hezbollah was cut off by... uh, uh, as a result, and then you cut off the Palestinian Authority, which has been brutalizing the people in Judea and Samaria, and our State Department is brutalizing the Israelis, the Jews who live in their historic homeland. All this is going off. You had, you had going was going on. You had peace breaking out all over the place. You had the Saudis ready to make a deal with Israel, having nothing to do with a Palestinian state and so forth. And then you have Blinken. In the Middle East, he's organizing the Arab countries to pressure Israel to surrender and to turn over maybe 30 percent of their country to their enemy. And by the way, none of these Arab countries are democratic. None of them have a parliament. None of these people stand for a vote. If they do, it's a joke. But uh, they, they seem to think the Palestinians will if they get a if they get a new country. And so all of this is being pushed by Biden, Obama, Blinken. Mali, Thomas Friedman, and the other reprobates, they're blowing up the Middle East, aren't they, Mr. Ambassador? Yeah, they really are. I mean, it's, it's really hard to watch because, you know, as you point out three years ago, uh, it was a whole different world. Look, Iran was broke. They were absolutely broke when we left office. Uh, they're now a very wealthy country. None of the sanctions uh, that were put in place are, are being enforced. They're selling, you know, billions of dollars of oil to Russia and China, our two biggest enemies. And um, and they're funding, they're taking all the money that they're making, and they're funding, as you point out, Hezbollah, they're funding Hamas, they're funding the Houthis. Um, they're, they're directing attacks against America that, up until now, our response has been incredibly tepid, you know, um, uh, from these responses. And, um, and, and the crazy thing is that, uh, as you point out, they're, 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 they, they want, the, the Arab countries in the, Gulf, in the area, they don't want a, a, a two-state solution. They don't want to create another terrorist state. They don't need another terrorist state making their lives miserable in the region of America for some reason. This is the democratic, you know, dogma. The Democrats must have a two state solution. They are it is it is their mother's milk of foreign policy. And look at this state that they want to create. It's a state of Palestinians, uh, eighty five to ninety percent of whom now side with Hamas, glorify Hamas. They're thrilled and exhilarated by the by the rape, torture, beheading, burning of innocent civilians and you want america wants to put its fingerprints on a state for these people i mean it 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 is just madness and and i can tell you the people of israel want to talk about a two-state solution you know like i want to talk about having root canal i mean this is this is the last thing they want to talk about it right now as they're grieving the loss of so many of their families as 130 people remain stuck underground who knows where 
you know, in tunnels, in shafts, never seeing the light of day, you know, being subjected to all kinds of abuse. Men and women are reported to being sexually abused. I mean, this is what Israel is facing. And, and, and they want to hear from their strongest ally that they should go to a low intensity battle and, and push forward for a two state solution. I mean, this is exactly the wrong message that they should be sending. And, and the enemies, the enemies of America and the enemies of Israel are watching this and they're laughing. I mean, this is giving them aid and comfort. This is this is giving them, you know, the gasoline, the fuel to go on because they see that America's greatest ally is, is turning against Israel. So it's, it's all very, very disturbing and frustrating from where we were three years ago. And why, Mr. Ambassador, as a matter of official Biden administration policy, have no policies changed toward Iran that existed on October 6th after October 7th? They still have not put the sanctions in. That is, they still have not enforced them. Uh, Even after the attack, they sent another $10 billion directly to them. Israel's the one that has to give up. Israel's the one that has to give up land. Israel has to do this and that. Iran doesn't have to do anything. What kind of insanity is this, sir? Look, they've they've, uh, made available to Iran in the last six months $16 billion of sanctions relief, $16 billion. That's more money than they were ever talking about giving to Israel in foreign aid. Uh, You know, yesterday, a 22-year-old man just wanted to be free, just wanted to express his desire for more freedom. He was executed yesterday by the the Iranian uh, government. Nobody nobody seems to be... You know, making any noise about that. Um, it, it's 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 an it's it's upside down. It's just all upside down. It's it's rewarding uh, and incentivizing the worst behavior. And it's failing to stand with the only democracy, the only friend that America has in the Middle East. That's been a true friend for 50 years, a, a mutual relationship, a relationship which gives great benefits to America on so many different levels. So I don't understand it. And as I said uh, earlier, it's very frustrating. Ehud Barak. I will say, was a failed prime minister, almost sold out his entire country. If it wasn't for Arafat, I don't think Israel would even exist today. Because that little rat fink wanted everything and couldn't get it all at once. But he almost did. And so he basically left the prime ministership in disgrace. And uh, today, yesterday, the week before, he's continuing his campaign against the current government and Benjamin Netanyahu personally, but he's endangering, in my view, the existence of Israel and the people of Israel, because even today he said that uh, there needs to be an election and we need to move to a two-state solution with peace negotiations with the Palestinians immediately. I mean, I'm thinking about our own country, if somebody was doing that and so forth and so on. You know, we'd be viewing that person as a saboteur. What's with this guy? Well, the good news is that in Israel, nobody listens to Ehud Barak. So, I mean, he's really a kind of kind of howling at the moon. Uh, he was a great general. I mean, when he was in, in the military, he did some great things. But somehow, uh, since he's been out, since he was defeated by Netanyahu about 20 years ago, he has had a, a uh, an axe to grind. But but he has fortunately uh, zero influence. I mean, he's tried recently to run for office. He's got no traction. Uh, look, look, you know, Mark, you have. Um, you have people like this in, in every society. Um, the question is, you know, do they get traction? And unfortunately, this is a guy who, um, who, who thankfully was never able to, uh, to implement any of his crazy ideas. And yet uh, this administration, ours, our, in our country, they're trying to pick off cabinet members out of this coalition government. They're meeting with the opposition party. Uh, they're building, as I said, a coalition of the Arab countries to try and uh, undermine the commander in chief there and the government there they're doing the same at the UN and the Europe have you ever seen an American administration treat another country like this yeah it's, it's hard to watch look you know the Israelis themselves will will have a reckoning from this event they, they'll they'll decide uh, whether to, uh, to keep or change the governments whenever they decide to do that that's their democratic right but right now um, even people that don't like Netanyahu are, are rallying around their leader because it's a time of war and you that's what you do in a time of war you rally around your leadership and you try to get through this and so for america to be injecting this type of you know kind of political um you know uh favoritism uh at this time you know and, and it's the media fault as well the, the media creates conflicts that don't even exist i mean the media blows up every disagreement between uh biden and netanyahu as this major rip because they also want to see netanyahu out so you know he, he's facing the challenge of his life 
Um, he is, uh, I believe, up to the challenge, and I think he will hopefully lead this country through the most challenging time in their history. But they don't need what they don't need is America showing up at the war cabinet, America offering advice as to how to prosecute the war, or America trying to, uh, you know, uh, move the pieces around to get a government of their choosing rather than of Israel's choosing. All right, Mr. Ambassador, we'll have you back. Very, very important to hear your voice throughout the country. David Friedman, God bless you, my friend. Well, God bless you. Thanks, Mark. Be well. He's a, he's a great guy. Absolutely terrific patriot. I'll be right back. Mark Lovin. Does social engineering from leftist corporations make you feel like we're living in the twilight zone? Well, you're not alone. Pure Talk, my wireless company, knows the silent majority is fed up. And I urge all those Americans to stand with a company that champions your values. Those of you who always have your neighbors back, who pulled yourselves up by your bootstraps, who realize that a little bit of elbow grease can fix just about anything. Well, it's time to join your fellow patriots who fled their old wireless company for something better. Pure Talk. Pure Talk gives you phenomenal coverage on America's most dependable 5G network for half the price of the other guys. And with unlimited plans starting at just $20 a month, the average family saves almost $1,000 a year. And it's a veteran-owned company. Pure Talk is a company you can feel proud to do business with. Just go to puretalk.com slash Levin to join your fellow Americans and make the switch. That's puretalk.com slash Levin and save an additional 50% off your first month with Pure Talk. Next hour, by the way, Representative Barry Loudermilk, who's going to tell us what the Democrats and uh, Kingsinger and Cheney, the Never Trumpers, did on this January 6th committee in terms of destroying a vast amount of data. And I don't know how they get away with this. But think about that. They're trying to keep information from you and me. They're rewriting history. Some of that information may have been exculpatory, as they say, uh, against some of the defendants. I mean, I find this unbelievable. And, of course, it gets no attention, so I'll give it attention. And also at the top of the hour, I will tell you how the voting is looking in New Hampshire. Very interesting. There's an internal battle in the country right now, as you well know, between good and evil and liberty and tyranny. A battle over the culture and truth. Family. Our border. Everything's at stake. Everything is at stake. As mature citizens whose ancestors built this country from the ground up, it's our time to rise and bring back our fundamental principles that America was founded on. AMAC, AMAC, the Association of uh, Mature American Citizens, is America's leading senior advisor, advocacy, and benefits organization. I'm not going to give you results yet, but it would appear that one of the candidates, Mr. Producer, is, let's see, 9.7% ahead of the other candidate. Can I say that without interfering in the election, Mr. Producer? I, th- I think I can. Yes, 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 yes. Let's ask the, is the man or the woman? I don't know that we can tell the difference. Nor do I know if we should. I don't think it's a proper anymore. More Donald Trump. Cut seven, Mr. Producer, go. Northern border is a huge deal here. We talk right all the time about Eagle Pass, Texas, and what's going on at the southern border. You, it's a huge issue here at the northern border. What are you the hearing from voters? Bad too. It's getting bad. I mean, it's getting bad. But now it's it's lightening up because it's so easy. They don't have to come here. It, it is, you have to watch both borders. And you have to watch fly-ins. You have to watch everything. But the southern border is like nobody's ever seen. But the northern border is bad, too. They have done a terrible job. This is one of the worst things. I believe it's one of the worst tragedies ever to befall our country. I really do. I think it's one of the great tragedies in the history of our country, what they've done. Either they're very 
stupid, which I don't believe they are, or they hate our country. It's very simple. It can be nothing else. They're very stupid or they hate our country to allow millions of people to come into our country totally unchecked, totally unvetted. Uh, it's it's not even believable. And it's the biggest issue now. You know, the economy was big and inflation was big. It's all big. But this, I, I think the border issue now is the biggest. We had the greatest border, the safest border of in recorded history. In recorded history. And that was three years ago. Now we have the worst. The worst. I think we have the worst border anywhere in the world. I don't think any country, a third world country, never had a border like this. Boy, he sounds like a dictator. He sounds like Hitler and Stalin combined. Oh, he sounds like a racist. No, he sounds like a patriot. A red-blooded American who loves his country. It's about time we had a president back who actually loves the American people and our history. That's what this election's about when you cut out all the static. When we come back, I will tell you where the race in New Hampshire stands... At the moment we return, I'll be right back. He's here. He's here. Now, broadcasting from, from the underground command post, deep in the bowels of a hidden bunker, somewhere under the brick and steel of a nondescript building, we've once again made contact with our leader, Mark Levin. America, Mark Levin here, and I consulted with my Mark Levin decision desk, which consists of Mark Levin. And I am declaring officially Donald Trump the winner in New Hampshire. He is, uh, let's see here, help if my eyesight was working. Well, He's over 9% ahead of Nikki Haley. So already the spin has begun, ladies and gentlemen. It's closer than they thought. Closer than who thought? Well, the polls are to be trusted. They're not to be trusted. New Hampshire's a trip. I'm looking at the votes, Mr. Perdue. Are you looking at the votes? He's got 9.6% more of the votes than Nikki Haley. You know what that is in most elections? A blowout. We'll see if it gets closer or further apart. But would you rather be in Donald Trump's shoes or Nikki Haley's high heels as I speak right now? So that's the report from the Mark Levin decision desk, and I am Mark Levin. That's all we know right now. 18% of the vote in. Donald Trump is up by 96 let me see here. Is it 9.6? 9.4% rather. Excuse me. I wasn't too bad at math, but it was never my number one subject. So he's up by over nine points over Nikki Haley. Now, I already told you how this is going to be reported in the end. As a big victory for Nikki Haley. No matter what, she could lose by 20 points. It's a two-man race. Excuse me. Two-person race. Between Donald Trump and Nikki Haley. It's a two-person race here. And she scored very well, even though she lost bigly. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter how many. Matter if she's 40%, 39.7%, 48.2%. Doesn't matter. She's the winner. Like Iowa. She comes in third. She's the winner. Wow. And, of course, we know what took place here. Dirty tricks. Dirty tricks, America. Played by Nikki Haley and Chris Sununu and the Republican establishment in the great state of New Hampshire. New Hampshire. Where they allow non-Republicans to vote in the Republican primary. Now, what the Democrats did is they took Joe Biden off the ballot. So if you're going to vote for Joe Biden, you've got to do a write-in. Then they realized, wait a minute, we got this Dean Phillips guy and this other lady here. We can't let them squeeze ahead. So then, frantically, desperately, the last few days, they've been telling Democrats, go to the polls and write in Joe Biden. Write him in. The Secretary of State in New Hampshire said, well, even if they don't write his name perfectly, if we can discern that they mean Joe Biden, you know, it's pretty tough on the other side. 
um, we'll count it as Joe Biden. And so uh, that's what's going on there. Hold on, let's see here. Wow. Yes. Hold on. Yeah. Okay. The Fox News decision desk has now projected Donald Trump the winner. And now all the spin begins all over cable, all over network news, all over the newspapers and the rest that Donald Trump lost. Right, Mr. Producer? He didn't perform as well as we thought he would. Even though it's a blowout in my view. But no, yeah, hey, that's your view. But the New York Times, the Siena poll, the YouGov poll, the this poll, the that. Hey, look. I thought the last poll showed Trump up by like 11%, didn't it? And you understand Trump is fighting the open voting system in a New England state where Democrats have moved many from Massachusetts into New Hampshire. And so they have this screwy voting. Why can't they just have a normal voting system? Well, because it doesn't help Republicans. That's why. That's why. So Donald Trump, we want to congratulate him. He won New Hampshire. Now on the South Carolina. No, no, Mark, you don't understand. I understand plenty. I understand plenty. If it were a real Republican primary, she'd lose by 30 points. But Trump, Politico, I read Politico. That's your problem. No, no, I read Politico, and they said Trump's going to have trouble winning all these moderate Republicans. He is, he is. Really? Really? Well, we'll see about that. Maybe he will, maybe he won't. But I'm sure his campaign is going to know how to try and encourage moderate Republicans to help join the rest of us in saving our country. And saving our country, because that's what this election is about. Joe Biden yells about democracy. Joe Biden has spent his entire life in Washington, D.C., the vast majority of that life in the Capitol building. And Joe Biden is, as I said on my Fox show, he is a Vilkef. You know what that means, Mr. Producer? He's raised in a cage. He has no access to the outside world. And he campaigns as a Vilkef. That's what he does. From his basement. But that cringe he can never wipe off his face. And so I want to encourage you, in order to have peace of mind, not to be stressed, at least when it comes to New Hampshire, all the spin, all the BS, and it's going to get worse because all the news platforms are going to have Nikki on. They're going to push her, push her, push her, try to get her to win South Carolina or get close to South Carolina. I think that's in four or five weeks, something like that. Just stay strong. Stay strong. Like I said, could get closer, could get further. I don't really care. But the spinners will care. That'll be a big issue for them. And as more time goes on, the numbers will come in. It's at 19%. We don't know what parts of the state are coming in, whether it's the more urban areas, the more rural areas, the more Republican areas. We just don't have any idea at this point. And... Uh, That's the truth. Let's see here. I'm looking for something that I saw earlier today. Just give me a second. Give me a second. Bear with me. Okay, who is this speaking now? I want to play this clip for you. Who is this speaking now? Cut 11. Go. What is your reaction to this thought that with your background in particular, with your career that there is some thought that you are incapable? Well, I I think that um, most women who have risen in their profession, who are leaders in their profession, have had similar experiences. Mm. Um, I was the first woman to be elected district attorney. I was the first woman to be elected attorney general of the state of California. And I'm the first woman to be vice president. Well, there you have it. How's and that I love my out? job. <laughs> oh, she loves her job. 
Well, she's a Democrat. She got elected in a Democrat state, and the Democrats got behind her because uh, the old Speaker of the House, Willie What's-His-Face, got behind her. And uh, so be it. She's won all these offices. And she's been a disaster in every damn one of them. But the reason I said, asked you, who do you think this is, even though her voice, it's obvious, Kamala Harris. Couldn't Nikki Haley be saying exactly the same thing? The answer is yes. Exactly the same thing. So she's criticized not because she's a flunky. She's criticized not because she's a moron. She's criticized not because she speaks gibberish. And remember, she's in charge of the southern border. So it's all because of her race and her genitalia. I should try that too, Mr. Producer, don't you think? Every time I'm accused of something, I should say, you're attacking me because I'm an olive-skinned Jewish person. That's why you're attacking me. That's the only reason you're attacking me. You know, folks, you should be sick and tired of this, and I bet you are. None of you are going to be vice president of the United States. None of you are going to be president of the United States. Most of you won't be senators and congressmen. And these people act like they're victims. They unleash holy hell on your lives. They interfere with your lives. They regulate your lives. They tax you. They get into your classrooms. They get into your bedrooms and your kitchens. They decide what kind of automobile you can drive. They can bankrupt you. They can drive up the cost of basic things you need for your own sustenance or that of your family. And they whine and they complain about how hard they have it and how hard they have had it. Doesn't it make you sick to your stomach? This ruling class, both parties. What a bunch of weak, pathetic, ignorant, inexperienced buffoons. She's vice president of the United States. On the one hand, she said, look at me, I'm vice president. I'm the first this. On the other hand, what was me? What was me? No. And that's supposed to be appealing. And unfortunately, for half the country, it is. I'll be right back. Mark Lovin. seen an election where somebody comes in third in one state and second in another and keeps declaring victory. Oh, Mark, you don't understand the next state and the next state and then ne- it's going to get harder. She's in New England. They have an open primary. 70% of the Republicans said they would vote for Trump. But the problem is Republicans aren't voting alone in their primary. And why states create situations like this or Republicans do, I'll never know. And so, uh, oh, it's closer than it would have been. Why? Because all the independents who are Democrats turned out and voted for Nikki Haley. Oh, great. Who cares? She's not going to be the nominee. But I wanted to talk to Barry Loudermilk, congressman from Georgia. Am I wrong, Mr. Loudermilk, about what I said? No, I know. I think you're absolutely right. When, you know, uh, you expect a northeastern state, the presumably more moderate candidate would would uh, be preferred. But in this case, I mean, Trump is uh, it just has run away with it. And, and it, it, the spin is just unbelievable. Let's put that aside. What you're doing is so crucial. It's hard work. You don't get a lot of applause, certainly from the media who will despise you for doing it. You are investigating what happened on this January 6th committee. And can you tell us what you and your group are finding and how much money and time you're having to spend to try and undo what they've done? Well, Mark, I I will tell you this. We're spending a lot less money than they did creating this uh, narrative that they did. But, yeah, I mean, it's recently we've been fortunate enough. uh, We did such hard work, and I can't. I can't lay enough compliments on my staff for the work that we did during the first year, uh, which was basically just trying to figure out what is it that we have, because our objective is to get the truth of what really happened. And uh, one thing we found out early on was we didn't have all the information that the select committee uh, obtained. There was key information that we, we did not have. I got a call from 
uh, one of the attorneys that represented someone who was depo uh, deposed by the select committee, and he wanted to review the videotape of their deposition. Uh, we went and started looking, and we had no videotapes, um, and found out that they didn't exist, even though they were they, they videotaped every deposition. Um, so I wrote a letter to the chairman of the select committee, the former chairman of the select committee, and asked him where those videos were, and he admitted they didn't keep them. Even though Liz Cheney in her book talks about how important it was that they had those videos and that they kept those. Um, that got us looking at what else we didn't have. Um, and so we, 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 uh, it, when I wrote Benny Thompson a letter asking him, where are these videotapes? And by the way, um, uh, where, where are some other documents that we started kind of getting an idea that we didn't have? Uh, he admitted that they didn't archive anything, and then we found a letter where he had sent key depositions to the White House and to the Department of Homeland Security. These are House wow. documents. These were th that that are required to be archived, and then that raises suspicion of why uh, what what's in these documents. And so I wrote letters to the White House, send these documents back. After a couple of iterations, they finally sent the documents. So heavily redacted, you can't read them. Uh, they don't so wait a minute. Hold on, hold on, hold on. So the House committee sends documents to the White House. They send them back to the House redacted. Exactly. Unbelievable. And they claim that there's national security information, but these, Mark, these are House documents. They don't belong to the executive branch. And so I've sent them another letter. They've got till tomorrow to, to send me back the unredacted versions of these. Now, just in the parts that we can read, um, we found out that these were White House employees who had close proximity to President Trump on January 6th. And in the run unredacted portions that you can read, it's clear that these, em these employees probably were not giving them the answers they wanted to hear. So mm -hmm. my suspicion is that's why they're sent away. We do know that the, I believe it's eight uh, depositions that the Department of Homeland Security has are of the Secret Service agents that were with him. And clearly, you know, their testimony is going to be important. But uh, Homeland Security isn't even responding to my uh, letter. So they have till tomorrow as well. But back to the first letter I wrote to Benny asking about this information, he responded and said, look, I gave you, you know, two million printed pages and we gave you four terabytes of uh, digital data, you know, but kind of like, what else do you want? Mm -hmm. Well, w w we didn't have four terabytes of data. We had less than three terabytes of data, which got us thinking, where's this other data? So we hired an outside independent forensics company to come in and take the hard drives that they handed over to us and do a low level scrape. And they recovered a lot of deleted documents. Now, some of them don't raise eyebrows because if you're working on a computer throughout a period of time, you're going to delete documents. But there was over 100 that were password protected and encrypted. And some of those were deleted in the days leading up to the Republican takeover. Wow. I mean, like the last week of December, first week of January, after the report had been completed. So... These are password protected, recovered documents. We were able to get one that was not password protected, Mark, and that document was related to the White House documents that were sent away. We think this one was recovered from a recycle bin. Uh, we think they just forgot to finish the deletion of that document. But that, um, that is at least one document that they did not preserve that we recovered from these hard drives, you know, all, all I'm asking for, if these, if this is no big deal, and you think all these documents that you deleted just days before Republicans took control of the House, and you, for some reason, figured you didn't want us to have these documents, at least give us the passwords to them. Mm -hmm. So we can well, look at them. I have to take a break. I, I'd, like to, I'd like to hold you over, if you don't mind. And sure. to me, this is really quite outrageous. I mean... Did they have the authority to destroy public records? You know, they indict Donald Trump on the, under the Presidential Records Act that doesn't even have an indictment power under it and all the rest of it. So you have members of this committee destroying documents, sending documents to the White House, 
doing all these things. And I wonder about the defendants in these cases, and I wonder about President Trump and exculpatory information. We'll be right back. Mark Levin, the thunder on the right. Call in now, 877-381-3811. Representative Barry Loudermilk is sort of Mr. Smith goes to Washington. He takes a look at what's going on there. He looks at the January 6th committee and he's finding a massive scandal. Committees aren't supposed to destroy records. Those records are part of history. And you only destroy records, uh, Congressman, if you're trying to cover up something. Otherwise, there's no reason to destroy them. If you think they're top secret, you slap that on there, you, you know, and so forth and so on. But you don't just eliminate one-fourth or more of all the data you have, videos that people are trying to get a hold of. And I was asking, when we departed briefly, let's take the case of Donald Trump. Maybe he wants to see the information that's in there that was gathered at taxpayer expense by this committee and see if there's any of that information that could perhaps help him in dealing with uh, the Democrats and the Department of Justice. And also, the American people, don't we have a right to this information as well, the full story? And people have a right to know what's happened going on with their government. Mm-hmm. That's the whole reason we're doing this investigation is because the American people have a right to know. And it's important that we know the truth if we're going to ensure that something like this doesn't happen again. Now, Congressman, I want to tell you something personally. I was contacted by one of the employers I work for, and they said the committee has 13 of my emails. I said, 13 of my emails? Did they ask for them? No. They have them. They showed them. to. And by the way, perfectly benign. But it doesn't matter. They got 13 of my emails. They didn't ask for those emails. They didn't call any lawyer and ask for those emails. They didn't subpoena the emails. They went around my back, a member of the media, and they got 13 of my emails. And I don't know what else they looked through. And I'm thinking to myself, should I sue Lizzie Cheney's ass over this? Uh, This is not a question for you. Because I want to know how the hell they tapped into my data and gathered information I had nothing to do with any. I wasn't there. I never spoke to anybody. Nothing. And yet they have 13 of my emails, which means they had to go through other stuff in order to get to that 13, didn't they? No, absolutely. And, the, and they, they weren't even responsible with the information they had. For instance, uh, they ended up getting some text uh, between me and the president's chief of staff um, on January 6th, which was, they were all benign. Other just saying, "Look, hey, the, you know, we need help down here. Uh, the Capitol's been breached." I mean, they're very benign as far as any scandalous uh, communications goes. But somehow, uh, right after they obtained all of these texts, CNN ends up with my cell phone number, yeah, my personal cell phone number. Yeah. And, and so, there's only one way they could have gotten that was from the select committee, but. When they made a false accusation about me and some people that uh, visited my office the day before, just constituents that came to my office, they came up with some crazy idea that, you know, there were reconnaissance tours, which was proven to be innocent, that there was nothing there. They they then doxed the name of people, uh, two of the people that came to my office, and one of those got fired from a from a job. And they didn't do anything but come and visit their congressman. So this is the way that the committee acted, that, uh, you know, it's besides these documents. I mean, they've admitted that they they did not keep certain documents. These videos of the depositions are huge. I mean, it's people say, well, you've got the written uh, transcript. Well, we, we do. We're missing some of those. We know, but we do have those. But. As one of the the members on my subcommittee put it, who's an attorney, he said, here's what's important with the videos, because it's the statement, I shot the clerk, is a lot different than I shot the clerk. I mean, there's Mm -hmm. voice inflection, there's there's body language that goes along with it. And so it's just interesting that even Liz Cheney put in her book how important those videos were, that they video 
taped every deposition, every transcribed interview, and how important those were to get to the truth. But they decide not to keep it. You know, I mean, in any just, other, in any other forum, whether it's a court, whether it is a school project or anything, you conduct yourself this way. You start destroying things, eliminating things, so people can't really see what you've been doing. No transparency. This is supposed to be a republic. We, the people, are supposed to know everything that committee gathered, and we have a right to know if those committee members who've been given enormous. Uh, in media attention and have been promoted, you know, in the media and the truth tellers and they're right. getting awards and everything. We have every damn right to know if there are those kinds of people and what our Congress was up to. And uh, this is a massive cover up. I'm sorry that I don't know how else. Now you talk about the data. So we know about videos. We know about a classified information what about just regular data? Is there just a lot of data missing? There is. I mean, you're talking over a, a, a one terabyte of data that. What does that mean? One terabyte claims they handed. I mean, that is a significant amount of digital information. That could be um, the video files. Uh, that that could be hundreds of uh, transcribed interviews. You know, we don't know that Benny Thompson said they handed over over four terabytes of digital data. We received less than three. So it's, you know, I, I have no idea what it could be. That is a huge amount of data. Um, but they have claimed all along that, you know, they transparency was the most important thing to them. But in my, my whole job has been to get to the truth. I've been trying to be very objective, and we've been very objective on this, not taking it from a bias one way or the other, just looking at the evidence and taking us where the evidence leads. But there are so many questions. Well, let me ask you a big question before you run out of time. Yeah. Here's my big question. It'd be very difficult, I suppose, to start interviewing, deposing, questioning in any form you want members of Congress, but they did have a staff. And they had a large staff. They had former yes. prosecutors on there. They had Democrat operatives on there. So is there anything that would stop you from using the power of the House of Representatives, you know, that with the Speaker and the others supporting you, to put some of these people under oath to find out what the hell happened to uh, this taxpayer-funded material that belongs to the people and belongs to the government? We're going to use every tool available to get these documents. Um, we're, we're, we're going to do it legally. We're going to do it ethically. But we're going to use every tool available. We could very possibly have hearings to bring in some of these people to, to answer questions uh, under oath. Um, look, you, you don't even have to have an, uh, swear somebody in. It's illegal to lie to, to Congress, True. right? Mm-hmm. So. Um, we're, we're going to, oh yeah, you have that new Enron, you got the the Enron stat, you've got the Enron statute now, you can use that for obstruction. Exactly. And, and, and well, you know, if you remember Speaker Pelosi, she set a new standard when she destroyed a government document, a house document right behind President Trump, when she tore up his state of the union address, which was Mm -hmm. a an official House document. So she kind of set a standard there that, you know, it's okay to make a political statement if you destroy a document. Mm -hmm. Fortunately, there we all had a copy of that. But (laughs) this is just interesting that the the documents that we know we don't have are the ones that were people who were with President Trump, actually with him, not like in the case of Cassidy Hutchinson, who was hearing stories that somebody else said, or, uh, you know, it it actually changed her testimony midway Mm -hmm. through the hearings. And so what we need to do is get those documents so we can compare all of those. You know, if you've got eight Secret Service agents and four other uh, White House staff members that are saying the opposite of Cassidy Hutchins, Hutchinson, then that ought to tell you something, okay? Mm -hmm. (laughs) So uh, we can't get to the truth till we get to the information. We're going to use every tool we have available to get to that information. I believe uh, we're going to obtain at least those documents that are at the White House and DHS. Yeah, it's amazing that you have to use these forensic techniques that are really safe for criminals. 
to figure out what the party opposite and that committee did. Uh, it's a daunting task, given the number of documents and interviews and all the rest. And it sounds to me like, uh, particularly at the end, when they realized they lost the House of Representatives, there was a frenzy to cover their tracks. There was a frenzy to cover up the narrative that they had, in many cases, perhaps concocted. You don't do this. You don't do it this way unless you're in full cover-up mode and destroying documents, official documents, whether you're in the executive branch, whether it's a court case, whatever it is, usually has some kind of criminal or other kinds of penalties. But because members of Congress did it and this committee did it, I think at this point, I wish those things applied. But I really do think there are Americans who are affected by this directly or may be and that they have a right to access this information that was destroyed. One last question before we go, because it's getting late here. Yes, sir. You watch these people on TV, the Liz Cheney's and the Kingsingers and the Democrats who were on this committee, the Raskins and so forth, beat their chests about what they found, what the evidence was, their conclusions. They're never challenged, even though you've been kind of out there the last few months explaining about the disappearance of information and so forth and so on. It must irritate the hell out of you that these people are talking and they know damn well that some information was destroyed or covered up that they are not revealing to the American people. That must be very frustrating. It is, it is very frustrating. But also, I look at what they say, because they will come back and say, oh, we, we have all the information. It's public. All you have to do is go to this website, and there's our report. And the links, there are links to all the supportive information. That's the key word, supportive information. No, I want all the information. Just not the evidence that supports your narrative. I want the other evidence, too. And so they're quick to say all the supportive evidence is there. That's what leads me to believe maybe what we don't have is the information that doesn't support the narrative in their report. That's mm -hmm. why I want to get to it. Well, you've already found some of these contradictions with Cassidy Hutchison, who wrote an entire book. Uh, yeah? Yeah. Yes, yes, absolutely. That uh, there's well, she she herself was a contradiction. We were able to find a an errata sheet, which you know is a sheet that's used to make minor technical corrections to uh, a sworn deposition or a transcribed interview. Um, but she waited for months till after she had changed her story. Months later. She did a an errata sheet that substantively changed her first three interviews. That's mm -hmm. that's the the strange. So yeah, we we found documents that where she's documenting that I'm totally changing what I said earlier. As one person told me, either way she's committed perjury. Either she lied in the beginning or she lied at the end. And just doing an errata sheet does not mm -hmm. <laughs> does not erase the idea that you lied somewhere in there to Congress. That's, I'm just wondering why the uh, select committee uh, didn't hold her to that standard. It's because it's a select committee. And look who they selected. Congressman, I want to exactly. thank you very much. Keep up your hard work. It's very, very important. Thank you, sir. Mark, it's an honor to be with you. Thank you. You too. God bless. I see our friend Carl Rove's on TV spinning away, Mr. Producer. Here's the here's a piece of data that really tells me everything I need to know. And I don't even need a whiteboard to tell you. Seven out of ten Republicans voted for Trump who voted, Mr. Producer. That's 70 percent if you had a straight up Republican primary. 70 percent. Got that, America? Now I'd stop listening to all the spin and all to the static because there's going to be a lot of it. I'll be right back. Mark Lovin. Spin away, spin away. There's a lot going on in the spin room, which we call the media tonight. How can Trump attract the moderates? I don't know. How can... Kelly attract conservative Republicans that make up the base, the majority of the Republican Party. Again, I want to remind you as we close down the program and you listen to all the spin. 70% of the Republicans who voted, voted for Donald Trump. 70%. This is why 
Nikki Haley was begging independents and Democrats dressed up as independents to vote. This is what Chris Sununu was depending on. So they're creating a pseudo event. They're creating pseudo news. And you'll understand three, four months from now how right I am about all this. Because she will not be the nominee. Unless something remarkable happens. But I'm making the point that the reality is that she needed she needed people who were going to vote for Joe Biden to vote for her. And she got a lot of them. But she still lost. And not by just a little bit. But the expectations, we don't play expectations. We salute all of you. God bless you and our heroes. Chin high. Trump won tonight. Haley lost. Case closed. See you tomorrow.